My name is Nick Oliver. I'm the founder of a company called People.io. My background, um, doing lots of things, but 15 years ago, I know I look the same, but 15 years ago, uh, I started my first company, which was a digital agency. And for my whole career, I've enjoyed solving big problems. And the problem that I'm solving at the moment is this. Companies want data, and people need control. The reason people need control is because they don't care. When people don't care, someone needs to care for them. And unfortunately, the industry is not doing that. They're doing this. So this is the marketing technology Loomscape. 5,000 companies that all hoover up data about people. With a view of creating this, the unified view of a consumer. It's the holy grail of marketing where a company knows everything about a person to help sell them something. Uh, very similar to this, in fact, where there's lots of different data coming in from different data sources from across a person's life. The difference is the first one is a platform sold by Adobe, where they need George Clooney to help convince you that you should collect people's data. The other one is a service provided by the NSA. And there's very little difference between the two. And that's slightly worrying. Um, so where does that data come from? It comes from places like this. So on the right-hand side, you can see a plugin I use called Ghostery. And it shows you all the different tracking technology used on a website. So on this website, the Daily Mail, there's 84 different companies that are tracking you while you're reading about the Kardashians. Um, here, Wi-Fi. Everyone uses Wi-Fi. We're using the Wi-Fi here, hoovering up data, all about the data. Tinder, you think Tinder's safe? Far from it. Someone recently requested their data from Tinder and found out Tinder has 800 pages of insights on each person. Um, Google Home, having a, having a device that accidentally overhears everything you're saying. And do we really trust Google that that was an accident when only a few years ago they accidentally collected all of the data about Wi-Fi networks with Street View? It's not really an accident. Um, and Facebook, can't leave them out. They're in court in the US at the moment because of their analysis of images, facial recognition to determine who you're friends with, who you work with, and who you go on holiday with without you ever telling them. Um, so this is what I always hear in the advertising industry. Consumers don't care about their data. It helps us make better advertising. And the best one, it's anonymous. Who cares? The data you have is not anonymous. It might be anonymous under the law, but if a person knew the data you had, would they really think it's anonymous? So that needs solving. And what we're doing to help solve that is creating a firewall for people. It sounds big and crazy, but it makes a lot of sense. Effectively enabling us and an individual to connect data from across their life through one unified view that they own and control. So we start with people like this. Um, really, really important consumers um, who have lots of other things to focus on. And so the way that we start with them is by creating an app designed for 18 to 25 year olds. So the user downloads the app, uh, they register, they provide clear consent where we highlight we don't sell the data the user owns the data, and if they leave, we delete the data. Um, we then ask them to enable their location, and 90% of our users enable their GPS location. And the reason for that is they get paid. It's quite simple. You turn on your location, we'll pay you. Um, and then we ask them to answer really simple questions, just like Tinder, swipe through the questions, and every time they answer a question, they get paid. Uh, and then we ask them to connect some external data, like their Gmail account, or perhaps their Spotify, and in the future, Fitbit and HealthKit. And that lets us collect a lot more data to understand what the user is about. And every time they connect data, guess what? They get paid. But from this view that we now have of the user that they control and they own, this first party identifiable data set, 
we can now connect a brand to that person. And guess what? When the person sees that advert, they get paid. So for the user now, it's a really simple process. Answer questions, engage with brands, get paid. From a brand's point of view, it's really powerful as well, because now, instead of guessing who, ha who has and who has not bought your product, or who likes you and who doesn't like you, you simply ask them. And once we've determined that that person is relevant to you, we match them with the brand, and then we can distribute content to the individual. Now, does it work? I think it does. So, so far, we only launched this year. So far, we already have 80 million questions that have been answered in the app. We have a 98% view completion rate on brand videos. We just did a campaign with lastminute.com and got a 28% click-through rate. 28%. It's ridiculous. So, do these people like it? Again, I think the answer is yes. Lots of really positive, very, very strong reviews. We were trending in the App Store recently. Um, and we were also recognized last year as being the NASDAQ rising star for the work that we're doing on trying to change the way not just advertising, but all industries approach data. Uh, I do a lot of work with the government as well, helping them understand about data and the impact of data. And the reason for that is because companies still think about data as being a valuable resource. Data is money. It's not. Data has no value. It's what you do with the data that has value. And what you have to remember is that as a brand, as an advertiser, you will never have all of the data from a person's life. But what you need to remember is where data comes from. Data comes from people. So there's different types of data. Data is not equal. Um, so I think about data in a slightly different way to the law. So first party data, uh, does first party data belong to a company? Here's a good question for everyone. As a company, if you talk about first party data, who owns that data? Generally, it's the company. Well, that's wrong. Why would you as a company own a person's data? It's called personal data, not personal data that belongs to a company. So the best way to think about this is using Brooklyn Beckham. So Brooklyn Beckham, imagine he's taking a selfie of himself, taking a picture with his phone of himself. Now, because he's taking the photo, he owns the mechanical rights to that image. He shot it, there was no professional photographer, so he owns the mechanical rights. But because it's only him in that photo, he also owns the intellectual rights and the imaging rights. It's his likeness that is in that image. Now, as a brand, if you wanted to use that image, you would go to Getty Images. And you would say, hey, we need a photo for an advertising campaign. And they would let you use that photo under a set of guidelines, and you would pay for the use of that image. Because you're making money from that image, so he should be entitled to a share of that money. That's how you should think about data. If you're collecting people's data and making money off of it, they should be entitled to a share of it. But not just money, value. Now, where it gets scary and a little apocalyptic is second party data, or what I think of as second party data. Intelligence that results from analyzing first and third party data. So this is uh, Google DeepMind from a few years ago now. Um, and it basically shows that you can upload an image into DeepMind. It can add all of this extra data to the image without humans needing to do it. Pretty cool. It helps you categorize your images. It helps you keep things organized. It helps you do image search on Google. DeepMind can lip read more accurately than a human. How is that possible? Well, with AI and machine learning, it's gone through lots of the videos on YouTube and taken the video content and the captions. But who created those videos and who created the captions? It's you. It's people. But who now has the value that's come from that? Google. And the reason that's important when you think about it from a brand point of view is that AI is stealing your value. As a consumer, as a brand, 
as a product, as a service. Because in the old world, you would have a data subject, a person, and their data would be held by a data controller. So imagine you're doing direct marketing. They have a big database of people's names and home addresses. And if you want to send some advertising to that person, you go to them and say, hey, I would like a list of 18 to 25 year olds in Moscow. And once they've got that list, they send the campaign and that's done. If they want the list again, they go back and they pay more. The problem with artificial intelligence is that even after you've deleted the data, it still retains the knowledge. You're not deleting the knowledge when you delete the data. So how do you make sure that that works from an economic point of view? If you take DeepMind in the UK, the NHS, our health service, kindly gave them two million people's health records without asking anybody. It was illegal, um, but they did it. And so DeepMind, uh, let's imagine DeepMind is now $50 million more valuable because of the data it got from our health service. And in five years' time, it cures cancer in part because of that data. And now it's $100 million more valuable. And they sell that cure to a pharmaceutical company for half a billion dollars, who sell it back to the health service for a billion dollars. Who pays for the health service? It's the person who's in the bed whose data was given to DeepMind to help cure cancer that now has to pay the health service to pay the pharmaceutical company to pay DeepMind. So because we're forgetting that intelligence is retained, we're going to start to see a shift. Now, brands, wake up. You're giving all of this data to those companies. So this is banks. Banks in Europe are scared to death because Facebook just applied for a banking license. But when you go on to a banking website, you can see that they're willingly giving away all of their customer data to all of the big tech companies. Telcos, no different, happily giving the data away. Automotive industry, throwing it at them. So if Google or Amazon or Facebook or Adobe or whoever want to start targeting and engaging with your customers directly, they already know more about your customers than you do. And you made that happen. So this argument, it's anonymous. In a world of AI, that doesn't matter, because AI never cared about your name anyway. AI only cares about a common identifier across a set of data to help it learn to see the patterns, to become more intelligent. And this film, I'm sure some of you will have seen it. I won't play the trailer. But it's a film called Her, where the star falls in love with an artificial intelligence. And the way it's able to do that, it sounds quite sci-fi, the way it's able to do that is because the AI knows more about that person than the person knows about themselves. And that's quite scary. Put it in the world of marketing, it seems quite fun. Do I want to buy a bouncy castle? Probably not. But if you know more about me than I know about myself, you can probably convince me to buy it. Because now I have to have a bouncy castle. But what about love? What about Tinder? If Tinder knows more about who I love and hate than I do, what stops Tinder making me love somebody? Even more scary, if DeepMind knows when I'm about to have a heart attack, who decides whether I should live or die? Who controls that data and that intelligence? Because you, as a person, gave it away. You, as a company, gave people's data away. And so it really starts by giving a person control over their data. And I'll leave you with a question. How do you advertise to a fridge? It's an important question. Because in a few years' time, when your fridge is the device that is ordering food for you, the quality of your fridge won't be determined by how cold it keeps food, but by the quality of the algorithm that orders food for you. Where does the data come from to power the algorithm? You don't plug your fridge into Facebook so it orders food based on a brand video you liked six weeks ago. You don't plug your fridge into a DMP so it orders the same as 50,000 other look-alike audiences. 
It needs to know about you. How much exercise you've done, how much money you have, whether you're stressed, whether you're at home. And where is that data? You as the brands don't have it. People don't have it. It's one of five big companies. And at that point, when the fridge is ordering the food and the advertising needs to happen, you can't advertise to fridges. It's programmatic. It's like the stock markets. It'll be trading based on what is right and wrong for you. And as a brand, you need to think about this. Because honestly, algorithms are incredible. You can do amazing stuff. But if you don't have the data, you can't do any of it. Amazon Echo is taking data away from you. Chatbots is taking data away from you. Consumer behavior is changing. The data will not exist, however cool your DMP is. And so we're giving people ownership of their data, and that is PeopleIO. Thank you very much.